to the extent that we're redesigning uh, social insurance programs, we should have an eye towards um, the, the automatic stabilizing um, properties of these programs. So what these programs do by design is they are uh, channeling resources to people with lower incomes. So there is a, a natural ability of any program like that to fight recessions because you're channeling resources to people who have been harmed in the recession, but moreover, these are people who are very, very likely to spend that money in the short run. So that will provide benefits to the economy as a whole. I'm Karen Dynan. I'm a professor of the practice at Harvard University. What we talk about in our research is we talk about you know, what can we do to tailor policy more specifically to what's going on uh, in individual states in terms of you know, where their economies are. And um, the tools you have to do so are limited um, because you need something, uh, you need something that's feasible, of course. Uh, you can't just have a clever economist idea that is then hard to put into practice. You need something that's scalable. Okay, you, the, the problem, there are you know, ideas to make our unemployment insurance program uh, more responsive to state level economic conditions. But the problem is it's just not a very big program. It's important to the individuals who are affected, but in terms of dollars spent, it's not that large a program. So it's not really uh, able to deliver kind of fiscal stimulus that would make a, a difference for an economy. Um, and you need something that's also going to be politically acceptable. So you need something that people feel like it's a really fair program. So what we suggest in our paper is um, a system whereby um, the, the payroll tax, which is the income that is taken out of people's paychecks uh, every, every pay period to um, fund Social Security, we suggest that that tax is used to um, provide countercyclical support to states. And in particular, what we suggest is that states that see larger rises in unemployment see their uh, payroll taxes temporarily cut until unemployment starts to decline again, in which case you then increase the tax rate back to normal levels. But the, the beauty of using the payroll tax is that it's, it's very feasible. Um, it's something that can be, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a just something that you can change in the computer system, such that the tax rate is different. Um, it's something that can be done at scale. So the amount of money that is um, taken out of people's paycheck through payroll taxes is um, kind of a large amount of money relative to the typical amount of fiscal stimulus you might apply, and even a pretty big fiscal stimulus. Uh, bill, and I would say the, the last thing is that it is something that I think would have political appeal because um, there would be a, a kind of broad group of people who would be able to benefit from the program. So it's not quite everyone because you don't get a payroll tax if you aren't paying payroll taxes if you aren't working. So it's not a program that would be helping people who are unemployed. It's not a program that would be helping retired people, but it would help a large swath of the population. So it's a way um, to, uh, to kind of allow a lot of people to benefit from the program and a way to get a lot of dollars into the economy. Yeah, so the social safety net, it was set up uh, decades ago. And um, you know, at the time it was set up, it was responding to economic conditions that were prevailing at that time. Um, but Things have changed over time. And uh, what that means is that we're going to uh, need to take those things into consideration uh, as we reform the social safety net. So um, several things that have changed our thinking over the last several decades uh, uh, would be um, starting with the, the situation with the federal deficit and, and debt in the United States. Uh, because of the aging of our population and the need to support the older population with income through the Social Security program and health care through our old age medical programs. Uh, we're going to see rising deficits and debt. And um, although um, 
current levels of debt and deficits don't seem to be presenting a, a problem for the economy or the financial system, they're projected to rise to levels that could be risky and impose significant costs on our economy. So the Congressional Budget Office projects that under current policies, we'll see um, the ratio of federal debt to GDP rise to something that's close to 150 percent, which would be really high by historical standards, uh, which worries people. So that's one uh, just key trend that we need to keep in mind as we rethink our uh, safety net and social insurance programs. Another important thing to bear in mind as we think about these programs is slower macroeconomic growth. So um, in the latter part of the last century, we saw growth of the real economy that was over 3% per year on average. Growth rates have slipped in the last couple of decades. So um, growth for the last couple of decades has been closer to 2%. And most macroeconomists are projecting that 2% rate of growth will continue on for the next several decades. Um, that's going to um, present some, some complications. We're going to see less growth in standards of living. Um, we're going to have uh, even more trouble uh, servicing the, the debt, paying back the debt, uh, the borrowing that, that the government's uh, done that we just discussed. So that's another important trend. Another thing that has happened in recent decades is we have um, We've seen it a decline since uh, the 1990s in, uh, in interest rates. And that's not only occurred in the United States, it's occurred globally. Interest rates since the early 1990s are down by something on the order of four or five percentage points. Um, there's some good things about that that's going to uh, make it, uh, it's going to reduce the, the payments on our, our, our debt. So that will be helpful in terms of paying off our government debt. Um, but the real problem is that it's going to change the way we need to fight recessions. So um, before the in, the, in the couple of decades before the Great Recession, um, the main tool uh, that we used to fight recessions was monetary policy. Fiscal policy was just thought to be too slow, too clumsy, too political. Uh, so we really left it to central banks to cut interest rates and, um, and support aggregate demand in an economic downturn. Um, but what we learned in the Great Recession is that uh, interest rates, um, they actually have fallen over time, and that's limited our ability to cut interest rates. So uh, in the last several recessions, we've cut, uh, the, the central banks have cut interest rates with so something like five percentage points. Um, right now, we don't begin to have that capacity. Uh, the policy rate for central banks is um, something that's more like two or three percent. So that's really going to limit um, our, our tools in terms of monetary policy. It's going to mean that we're going to have to rely more on fiscal policy. Uh, over the last several decades, uh, we've seen um, We've seen growth in the economy overall, but the growth has not been broadly shared. We've seen very large increases in incomes at the top uh, and very limited increases uh, in the middle and bottom part of the income distribution. The final important uh, trend that we've seen is we've seen households, particularly in the middle and lower part of the income distribution in the United States, really struggle to build wealth and accumulate savings. So uh, if you're looking at the bottom 40% of the population, those that part of the population really is doing very, very little saving. And what that means is that they have um, very thin financial buffers to, say, whether it's uh, recessions, but um, also to uh, support themselves in retirement. So all of those things are going to make a difference as we rethink how we want to set up these uh, social insurance and safety net programs. In terms of the implications for how we uh, should think about um, our social safety net uh, programs, uh, there are a number. I'll take you through a list. Um, let me start with um, Social Security. That's something that uh, 
people have been talking about for a while now. We know that the finances of the social security system are not sustainable over the longer run. The baby boom has been paying in um, as in their working years, but uh, they started to retire about 10 years ago and are now drawing more in terms of benefits. So eventually that's gonna drive the system to insolvency as it's uh, set up and it's going to require uh, cutting benefits. But the whole question is, um, it's gonna require either cutting benefits or uh, doing something to increase revenue. But the whole question is, you know, what do we do about that? And I think, you know, if you take these trends that I talked about um, together, I think they make a strong case for fixing it in a way that's progressive. So um, not cutting benefits for people in the, the, the middle and lower part of the income distribution. Instead, um, relying on collecting more revenues uh, and perhaps curbing benefits at the top of the income distribution. I think you know, the key logic there is just that we've seen this growing income inequality. And so it would be hard to, to fix the, the system by, um, by cutting benefits or uh, trying to raise revenues at the bottom. And I think it would be perceived as, as unfair and politically controversial. So that's, that's one of the implications of the different trends I talked about. Another key implication is that um, we're going to have to find a way to curb the spending we do on, on health care. The spending has been driven up both by the fact that we're going to have many more older people as a share of our population, um, but also by these rising health care costs. Um, so, uh, in the absence, and we've seen uh, healthcare spending grow as a fraction of the budget uh, enormously, and we're going to see it grow. Um, we're going to see it grow further going forward. Um, given our other uh, kind of the other things that we have taxing the government budget, uh, if we don't curb healthcare spending, we're going to have to pare back on all these other programs that are so valuable um, as part of the social insurance and safety net. So we're gonna have to cut back on uh, you know, spending on poor children, uh, cut back on, on education, cut back on infrastructure. So let me tell you about another important implication of these macro trends. And um, that is that we uh, really um, should not cut spending on poor children and uh, on their parents, uh, and preferably we should increase spending on poor children and their parents. So there's been this um, literature uh, in economics that has um, grown over the last couple of decades that is showing that the spending that we do on poor children, it's not just helping these children in the moment. It's not just making their life better in the moment, which it is, um, but it's also like an investment in these kids. So the literature has shown us that spend on you know, someone when they're, when they're small uh, through a, a program like food stamps, through a program like the Earned Income Tax Credit, and you'll see a, de you'll see a payoff years later, even into their adult lives. So children that we're spending on uh, we see them as adults, um, we see them more likely to participate in the labor force, we see them with higher incomes, we see them less likely to have health problems, we see them uh, less likely to get involved with the criminal justice system. Okay, so, so, so these programs, they're like investment in these kids. And um, obviously, uh, it's very beneficial for the people who are directly involved, but it's actually important for all of us because um, the more we can help these children grow up to be productive members of society and a productive part of the economy, uh, the more we're going to see economic growth. We're going to see higher incomes and higher tax revenues, which will help us with the with the challenges of, of high growth and uh, growing fiscal imbalances. So let me tell you about another one of the implications I draw from these various macro trends, and that is that our automatic stabilizer programs, um, 
the programs that we uh, use to fight recessions. Um, to the extent that we're redesigning uh, social insurance programs, we should have an eye towards um, the, the automatic stabilizing um, properties of these programs. So what these programs do by design is they are uh, channeling resources to people with lower incomes. So there is a, a natural ability of any program like that to fight recessions because you're channeling resources to people who have been harmed in the recession, but moreover, these are people who are very, very likely to spend that money in the short run. So that will provide benefits to the economy as a whole because they'll be out there spending it and it will support aggregate demand and uh, allow the economy to heal more quickly. So these programs do tend to serve that purpose, um, but the fact is that that was not particularly the way they were designed. So, um, you know, as we rethink any changes we make to these programs, if we could think more about the, the, the way to make them um, kind of most effective in this regard, we'd be well served by that. And I say that um, partly because I feel like we're going to need to rely more on fiscal policy to fight recessions in the future because of the limitations on monetary policies reduced, uh, caused by reductions in, in interest rates.